Welcome, everyone, uh, to the 18th Annual National Book Festival. My name is John Haskell. Uh, I work at the Kluge Center in the Library of Congress. And uh, we're, we're proud to have sponsors for this event, including Wells Fargo, David Rubenstein, The Washington Post, and The New York Times, and many others that make it possible to have events like this that are free to the public, thus officially the best free event in Washington, D.C. So, so by way of preparation, before we get into the conversation, uh, of course, you need to, to silence your electronic cell phones, that sort of thing. So today we're talking to Patricia O'Toole, who is uh, the author of The Moralist, and uh, she's also written uh, several other books, including in particular, When Trumpets Call, Teddy Roosevelt, After the White House, and uh, Five of Hearts, an intimate portrayal of Henry Adams and his friends, 1880 to 1918. That was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. Welcome, Patricia. Thank you, John. Um, what motivated you to write a biography of Woodrow Wilson? He was a big puzzle to me. And in the beginning, I wanted to write about him because the Roosevelt book has a lot of World War I in it, and I got totally fascinated by World War I. Um, but I, I thought I would write about him as commander-in-chief, and then I learned that he delegated most of the responsibilities, so there wasn't enough for a book, there was enough for a paragraph on <laughs> Wilson as commander-in-chief. So then I started thinking about his record in office. He was highly successful for six years, and then he had a terrible last two years. So he, it's a very kind of mixed legacy, and I was just curious. I'm basically a student of character, not a student of presidents necessarily, and I just wanted to know why that happened. In the last 10 years, uh, both Scott Berg and John Milton Cooper have come out with uh, well-acclaimed biographies of Wilson. How should, how should we think about your book in context with those? They're really quite different. This is why people can go on writing biography after biography of uh, uh, major figures. Um, John Milton Coopers is a, he's a political historian and a very, very good biographer as well. And he concentrates more on the politics and he's trying to cover a lot more ground than I am. When I chose my focus of the moralist, I was really concentrating on the events in Wilson's life that I could tie to my notion of him as a person who was deeply principled and led from his principles. The Scott Berg book is a little bit like mine in that he has a focal point, um, and that's Wilson's Christianity. Um, and he really uh, works that out in great detail. And I thought, um, that Wilson's morality was based on more than Christianity. I thought it was based as much on American civic ideals. So I guess mine would be uh, expansion, not in the sense necessarily of being better, but just I wanted to add that civic ideals picture to well, it. Let's go a little further into that because that's, you know, you, you called the book The Moralist. And so uh, uh, talk to us a little bit more about where that moralistic streak came from. He was the child and, um, I mean, there, he was the child of a Presbyterian minister. His mother was the child of a Presbyterian minister. There are Presbyterian ministers all over the family tree. So Christianity is definitely a formative influence. Um, and, but, but once he started getting interested in politics, he really was interested in, you know, how do you, how do you make things happen in politics? He was a great as a young man, uh, even as a teenager, he hung a portrait of a British prime minister in his bedroom. Um, any children here today who do that? Uh, <laughs> kind of unusual boy. Um, then he went to Princeton and he's studying government and kind of studying comparative government and politics. And um, eventually he, he decided that I mean, early on, he decided he wanted to be a statesman. That's, that's what he wanted to be. So he sets off in that direction. And the great statesmen that he admired in the 19th century were fantastic orators. So that's what he perfected. He learned how to project his voice. I don't know what I would do in this room without a microphone, but Wilson could speak to an, a crowd outdoors of 10,000 people and make his voice heard without amplification. So he went at that part of it, training himself the way an actor would. 
And he thought that his job as a leader, once he got uh, to the White House, was to think really hard, get advice here and there, but think really hard about the right thing to do, and then talk people into doing it. Um, in other words, some, some politicians would think, well, I'm going to have to negotiate, I'm going to have to compromise. But Wilson just wanted to find the right thing according to his principles and also what he thought was possible in a given set of circumstances, and then talk you into uh, seeing it his way. So is, 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 uh, in the end, is, is being a moralist or having this streak of, uh, you know, a moralistic streak, is that in the end a strength or a weakness? I mean, clearly it's both. But if you, if you were to weigh yes. it. Yes. Well, what, what happened to him is a, a cautionary tale, I think. Uh, for the first six years of his presidency, he has majorities uh, in both houses of Congress. So much legislation gets passed, and everything is going his way. And uh, he understood that the majorities were key to this. But he also, I think, overvalued his oratory in getting things happen, because he would go to Congress when he wanted a big law, make a very eloquent speech about it, and then poof, he would get the great law, and he would think it, was, it might not have happened without his oratory. But he succeeds for six years. And then come the midterm elections of 1918. So we're, I mean, it's kind of interesting to think about this in terms of this year's. This will be the centennial of that election, which was one of the most consequential elections ever in American politics. He loses both the House and the Senate, and nothing goes his way after that. But he's defiant in the face of this, of this new political reality. He doesn't, um, he doesn't begin to do things like compromise and negotiate uh, that he didn't have to do before. Um, spoiler alert, things do not go well. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm going to switch gears for a second, and we'll get back to to uh, talking about some of the things he did legislatively. Many of us uh, have read largely older biographies, but even some recent ones uh, of Wilson that, that uh, are based to a significant measure, I think, on the views of, of what, who, the, the man who was called Colonel House, Edward House, who was, a, I guess, an informal advisor. Yes, he to, was to, his to, confidant, to, his yeah, chief confidant. Right, yeah. uh, to Wilson. And yet, you don't seem to rely on Colonel House. So what's that about? You know, what, did, what did you figure out that was different than, than other people had? Well, I tried to, you know, when you come along after 600 biographies have been written, <laughs> you have to think about what you can do that's a little different. Um, and um, my point of view of him as a moralist and that with strengths and weaknesses, because he doesn't, he doesn't shift, and his, his morality becomes uh, self-righteousness rather than straight moral principle. Um, he, Colonel House was quite useful in domestic politics. He was a, a fixer, not a corrupt kind of fixer, but he was the one who could finesse Senator so-and-so into changing his mind about things. And he was very good. He had a lot of contacts. Um, and Wilson didn't, because before Wilson went to the White House, his sole uh, political office was being governor of New Jersey for two years. So he didn't actually know a lot of people in the Democratic Party. House knew them all. Um, so he was useful in that way. And then uh, Colonel House discovers foreign affairs. And it's like uh, champagne for him, you know. And he becomes hooked on this champagne, and he wants to try every variety of champagne that there is and drink more and more champagne. And he, he greatly overestimated his abilities. Um, the British referred to him as the empty house. Um, and he was, Colonel House, one of his main strategies uh, in dealing with people was flattery. And he thought he was so good at it, but he didn't understand that people were flattering him. So he took at face value all the compliments that people uh, paid him, and that's kind of fatal, you know. So um, he wasn't useful in uh, foreign affairs, and not only that, he was quite duplicitous with Wilson. He would tell Prime Minister so and so, or the French President, this or that, and then he would tell Wilson something else, and we'll we'll work it out. So there's a lot of um, duplicity. And, yeah. and you, you actually depict him as an unreliable source. He is an unreliable source, and, yes. And, and so He's, how did you come to that conclusion? Well, he, you can read his wheelings and dealings with, I mean, f 
For years, biographers used, uh, the House published its four thick volumes that are excerpts from his diaries, and they're useful to a point. But um, everything is about how wonderful Colonel House is. So <laughs> then I thought, OK, he's with the German ambassador. Let me go find out what the German ambassador had to say about his meeting with Colonel House. So you get sort of different, Im different impressions by you know, the more you can uh, bring different sources to bear on things. So um, I came to think he was, he certainly cared deeply for Wilson. Um, and ultimately, they broke up at the Paris Peace Conference <laughs> when uh, Wilson found that House had been really working around his back. But there's a very sad moment when Wilson dies and House is waiting for the White House, or Wilson's out of the White House. He's waiting for Mrs. Wilson or somebody in the Wilson family to invite him to the funeral, and there was just no invitation, so it's it's kind of sad. Uh, it, but his, uh, you talked about his legislative record, and he got a lot of things passed, particularly in the first few years, but also in the first six years. Uh, give us a taste of those legislative accomplishments. He was elected on a package of economic reform called the New Freedom, and the big things were to try to root out the plutocracy of the age. I mean, thank goodness we don't have to think about that anymore, right? <laughs> Oligarchs, plutocrats, it's all gone now. It's wonderful. Um, so um, Wilson uh, actually works with um, Brandeis, who had been thinking along these lines. Um, and to, Wilson had a lot of ideas, but they were sort of scattered. And to get all of this stuff into a platform, he works with, with Brandeis. And they. Uh, they overhauled, taxes used to be um, mostly collected from revenues on imports, um, tariffs in other words. Thank God all that's gone too. <laughs> um, so um, that ended up costing consumers money. We're beginning to see something like that uh, now with this new round. Um, so one of the things was to get rid of a lot of these tariffs which meant that American manufacturers would have to compete on a more even footing with uh, foreign manufacturers, and prices might actually come down. Um, and that was, it was a rough adjustment, but it, it worked. And then there's the question, of where do you get more revenue if you're taking away tariff revenue? And the answer was to introduce an income tax. And um, this happened. Um, and if, you, if we want to make America great again, we should bring back the first income tax because half the people didn't have to pay anything, and the highest earners, and it was $500,000 or more a year in 1916, um, you, your top rate was 7%. So I think everybody would be very happy if we could <laughs> go back to that income tax. So he, he gets rid of the tariffs, introduces the income tax, creates the Federal Reserve, which basically um, eliminated a lot of the kind of bank panics that had been very common before that and put the United States in kind of the same mold of um, European central banks. Um, created a new antitrust law that was more, re it was easier for corporations to understand and then created the Federal Trade Commission. And I, th I think the measure of success of those things is that they're still here. A hundred years later, they're still here. So it's very successful. How, how does he stack up? Uh, because normally people say, well, the people who had the, the incredible legislative packages were Roosevelt and the New Deal and the Great Society in the 60s with Johnson. Right. Um, how does he stack up there? I think he stacks up very well. Um, uh, maybe, I mean, certainly the New Deal, there were more measures, but there was a depression. And Wilson got the big things, the big pieces right. Uh, so I think he stacks up very well. And so what was the, the uh, you know, you talk a lot about the cost of doing business. You know, uh, it's, it's never easy to pass these things. You know, compromises, ha even though he doesn't like to compromise, compromise has to, right. has to be made. What was the cost of doing, what was the major cost of doing business? Well, the major cost of doing business is, is one that still haunts us. Um, he had to get Southern votes for these economic reforms. And Southerners, as a general matter, did not like expansions of federal power. And all of these economic reforms involved vast extensions of federal power. So they wanted a sign from Wilson that he wouldn't do anything about segregation. And the sign that, that to undo it in the South. He wouldn't mess with state laws about uh, race and segregation. So what they asked for as a sign of his uh, 
going along with their desires was for him to segregate the civil service, which he did. And the civil service had been a happy place for African Americans, actually, in the decades before that. They, they were not up there in the supervisory rank so much, but he, a, an African American living in Washington um, could get a civil service job, and there were many, many, many of them in the ranks. Um, so the first um, incursions against them under this new regime were to separate the workspaces. And then, you know, there's no more integration of the restrooms, so you have black employees having to go to the basement to uh, go to the restrooms or having to eat at separate lunch tables. So it was just insulting kind of stuff. And then it got rougher than that. They required um, people applying for jobs in the civil service to submit a photograph. So immediately, it's easy to tell, in most cases, who's black and who's not. Um, and um, it was, it, this, this ruined a lot of what had been a path of upward mobility for blacks for a long, long time. And it didn't go away when Wilson gets blamed for this, and he deserves blame because he's the guy who started this. But um, it went on uh, through the New Deal. I mean, there were many things like this where Roosevelt could get votes for Social Security if, from Southerners if you left out domestic workers and farm workers because that's where most blacks were working. So it's a very long, terrible legacy. Now. Um, Somewhat controversially, you wrote, Wilson knew segregation was morally indefensible. How did you arrive at that conclusion? I arrived at that conclusion. It was interesting. Wilson was not in good health. Basically, his doctor, a man named Kerry Grayson, was at the White House almost all the time while Wilson was president. And uh, Wilson, if he had to do something where his ideals were in conflict with the action he had to take, he. It, it often made him physically ill. There are a number of instances of this. And there were two instances where um, people wanted to talk to him about segregation in the civil service and undoing it. And they ended up having kind of knock down, drag out conversations in his office. And um, Wilson was, after the first one, he was so upset, he went to bed for like three days. You know, he was just profoundly upset by this. And I think it's, um, you know, when you have to do something you really don't want to do and you feel it's morally wrong, uh, it can have a somatic effect. And he, he responded to stress in that same and way, And he did too. it repeatedly, right? Yeah. I mean, this happened repeatedly. Yes, yeah. yes, it happened a number of times. So, yeah. so uh, you mentioned, um, I guess we both mentioned that he, uh, I'll put it in your words, showed no interest in mastering the arts of friendship, collaboration, and disagreement. I'm kind uh, of, uh, to the point of disdaining negotiation on principle. You talked about that. I mean, that's odd for a politician. How, you know, it is what, odd, it, isn't it? <laughs> how did that cost him uh, in terms of the, of the peace conference or in other ways specifically? Yes. Um, well, this is back to this thinking he can talk you into submission yeah. thing. And it, at the peace conference, uh, this is the after World War I, and he goes to the Paris Peace Conference. Um, he's just lost the midterm elections of 1918. He doesn't appoint any leading Republicans to be on his peace commission. He's just defiant. He goes off. And then he has to deal with these. He thinks he's going to have a lot of SWAT because the United States really did help to win the war, first with lending um, the Allies millions and millions of dollars, and second with um, our army was late getting there, but. There were, in the end, two million soldiers on the ground in France, and that did, it was instrumental in turning the tide and ending the war. So he thought he was going in with a very strong hand, and he just wasn't up to um, the sort of close combat that you do when four powerful heads of state are, are negotiating. And he wouldn't listen to his Secretary of State. He didn't like his Secretary of State at, at all, Robert Lansing. Um, so you get this in the record. This, is, this was all in the Library of Congress, actually, part of my research. I'm reading what's happening in the Paris Peace Conference in these conferences with Wilson and his opposites from France, um, England, and Italy. 
and then reading what Lansing is writing. You know, Lansing knows what's going on, but he's not asked to take part in very much of it. And Lansing's making predictions about what things that are going wrong, going to go wrong in the future because Wilson is not up to the task of negotiating in the way that these European diplomats have had to do um, constantly. And then he has to bring this agreement to Congress, to the Senate. And he brings it to Congress, yes. He comes home in July of 1919. Meanwhile, Henry Cabot Lodge, who is his main adversary in the Senate, and at this point he's the Senate Majority Leader, also the senior senator in, uh, in Congress. He's a pretty old man at this point. Um, actually, I was just thinking he was my age, so like. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he, uh, Lodge uh, actually was giving, he, Lodge, Wilson was playing things pretty close to the vest in Paris, but every once in a while he'd have a press conference and information would come back to the United States. So Lodge had an idea of what was going on and he had fears about um, uh, overcommitting the United States in foreign affairs. People paint him as an isolationist and he really wasn't. He was kind of a, he wanted to be a great power like the other great powers. Um, so, but Lodge is making these speeches which if Wilson had read them, they were Lodge's game plan for defeating this, the treaty that he thought Wilson was going to bring home from Paris, but Lodge wasn't, uh, Wilson wasn't paying any attention to Lodge. So Wilson brings the treaty home, it goes to the Senate, the Senate drags its feet for a really long time, and Republicans are speaking out against the treaty. Uh, the covenant for the League of Nations was part of the treaty, and that was a sticking point for the Senate. They just thought it overcommitted the United States, and we would be sending troops to every war that happened in Europe from now till kingdom come. So Wilson goes out on a speaking tour to the United States. He's going to go over the heads of the Senate and explain to the American people what the League of Nations was, why the United States should play a major part in it, why it would be good for the world, and then he expected that people would write their senators and you know, this would change the minds of, the, after senators heard from enough constituents, they would change their minds about things. Well, uh, Wilson was not in good health uh, at this moment. And his, his speeches, it's very sad to read them because he's not, you know, he's, he's clearly failing at his superpower, which was oratory. Um, and in the middle of this tour, well, about two-thirds of the way through, he collapsed, and the train had to hurry back to Washington. And then, about a week after he got home, he had a major stroke that paralyzed his right side forever. Um, and he couldn't be, he couldn't lead the fight for the treaty. Um, and there was a little bit of talk about should he resign, but one of his reasons for not resigning was that the vice president, a man named Thomas Riley Marshall, who had been the governor of Indiana before he was vice president, he knew, Mar you know, the vice president's president of the Senate, right? So uh, Marshall had already said he would be willing to compromise on the kinds of points where the Republicans wanted compromise. And that was just anathema to Wilson. So he hung in there. And uh, the treaty was defeated, not once, but three times. And the United States never joined the League of Nations. So, so you wrote that Wilson uh, during World War I, quote, repressed dissent more often and more harshly than any other occupant of the White House. And you went on to write, in a novel construction, the good American was no longer the citizen who revered freedom, but the one who refused to tolerate those who disagreed with their government. I mean, what, what would she, should we make of this? It, it's it's a quite a shameful episode, and um, two of the major laws of, about repressing dissent are still on the books. Um, so, you know, don't tell anyone outside this room, but I, <laughs> I worry sometimes that they're going to be invoked. Um, uh, uh, it was uh, the reason, the ostensible reason for doing it was that one third of the population was either uh, they, they were immigrants or they were children of immigrants. And the thought was that you have this world war and you have all these people who are in the United States who have cousins and uncles fighting in this world war on one side or another. So he feared that a sort of miniature version of the world war could happen in the United States just because 
you have such a large percentage of the population disagreeing about what was happening in the war. So once the United States is in the war, he doesn't want anything like that to happen. He thought it would compromise our chances of winning. Mm -hmm. So that was the ostensible reason for this, yes. So he's, he once said before he became president, uh, this is Wilson, quote, it would be an irony of fate if my administration had to deal chiefly with foreign affairs, end quote. Did in the end that the foreign affairs side of his presidency have more impact than the domestic? Well, the domestic triumphs still stand, and his notion of uh, what should happen in the world was truly revolutionary, and we still, I, I admire it very much, and I think we're, that some people in the world are still trying to figure out how to make it happen. It's not that you have a world government, but you have a world organization that can, uh, his, his insight was that global problems require global solutions. Um, that still makes sense to me 100 years later. Um, and his, his impact um, has, has diminished. And people uh, argue about how important it is and that what happened after, um, or actually during World War II, FDR was, in, in Wilson's presidency, FDR was the secretary, assistant secretary of the Navy for the whole eight years. And FDR was also a young man who wanted to be president someday. So he's watching the president very, very closely and thinking about, oh, this works, that doesn't work so well. He's learning a lot from this experience. So early in 1942, FDR assembled some advisors and he said, I, th I think we're going to need something like the League of Nations, but this time we have to make it stick and we have to figure out how to make it work. So these people studied what had worked, what had not worked in the League of Nations. And also, Roosevelt, once he decided he wanted to do this, he began cultivating uh, the other side, people who were likely to be opposed to more international involvement, uh, isolationist kind of people. And that was something Wilson never did. Um, he, so uh, FDR is going about it in a politically, I think, smarter way. And FDR and his advisors also figured out, or they, they, they concluded that the League of Nations had been asked to do too many things. And it would be better if you had the League of Nations and then you had other associations, either regional or global, to tackle big things. So out of this, in the post-war, early post-World War II era, we get things like the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank and NATO, and so that everything doesn't come out of the UN. And that model um, held until pretty well. I mean, it went through various changes, various presidents um, thought of ways to pull back. Um, it's thought that um, President George H.W. Bush was the last liberal internationalist, which is what followers of Wilson had come to be called. Um, he's also the last president who fought in World War II. And then after that comes um, Bill Clinton, and there's a, there's a pulling back. It's like, well, we still are internationalists, but we're going to pick and choose what we're going to do. And then comes George Bush with the doctrine of preemptive war and um, not so much respect for the kind of nation building that um, a, a good old fashioned liberal internationalist would be in, in, in favor of. Probably the biggest example of that as, as a good model would be the Marshall Plan, you know, that if you uh, make a big investment, you're likely to get a big um, payback. And now we're at uh, a moment where, uh, you know, it's a moment of crisis for the old liberal international order. Um, and this idea of going it alone in the world, I just don't see how that, I mean, Wilson understood in 1918 that that was um, uh, not a feasible proposition anymore, just because of airplanes, and airplanes being able to go everywhere to bomb. Um, and Wilson's idea was you fold the whole world into one alliance, and then you don't have to have these competing alliances and spend a lot of money on arms and so on. And you could probably prevent a lot of wars that way. So we, we're now, I don't know if we're, we're at the beginning of a new era or the end of the old era. I mean, I think it'll take us some time to sort that out. But I think Wilson's idea, his basic idea that in, you know, in this really interconnected world and 
if you've got global challenges like climate change, it's probably a good idea to have global solutions. Um, so that's where we are right now, is not knowing if, if the old order will come back or we're into a whole new order for the United States. We're still up in the air about the role of the United States on the world stage, I think. Before we get to some questions, we'll have some uh, questions in a minute or two. Um, a lot of um, American historical figures uh, you know, have prominent places, schools, colleges, uh, you know, high schools, universities, programs named after them. And, monuments, et cetera, and a lot of them, and Wilson's among those who are controversial now because of positions on race and other things. Um, how do you think about that? How do you think we should think about Woodrow Wilson in terms of, of uh, I guess some might say, imposing our, our, uh, the, the current ways the of present thinking, values. Yeah, present yeah. values on the past? Yes. How do you think about uh, that? The way I think about it is um, uh, not a way that everybody thinks about it, but I think when you erase the history, then a bad thing can happen. You know, it just disappeared. It's as if there never was this history. So I'm more in favor of explaining than deleting. But I've also been moved by, you know, that speech that um, the mayor of New Orleans made about, uh, he just, you know, many people had talked to him about how painful it is to walk past the statue of Robert, you know, African Americans, how painful it is to walk past the statue of Robert E. Lee and these celebrations of, of the Confederacy. Um, this is not, I mean, we've seen, it's, it's not, you know, there's a whole Wilson aspect of this as well at Princeton, and they've made some changes, but they decided there's a Woodrow Wilson um, School of Public and International Affairs there, and that name still stays, but they've made some, some other changes. Um, in, uh, in New York City, uh, I did a project with the American Museum of Natural History once. Uh, they were revising their Theodore Roosevelt Hall, or remodeling it. And there's a statue, maybe some of you have seen it, outside on Central Park West of Theodore Roosevelt on a horse. And there's a Native American walking on one side of him, and a, a, not even like an African American figure, but like an African figure, for some reason, walking on the other side. And he's, you know, uh, um, Roosevelt, in his younger years, thought that uh, he said about settling the West, whether by treaty or annihilation, we're going to settle the West. I mean, that is really harsher than anything Wilson, uh, Wilson ever said. Um, so there are a lot of people who would like that statue to come down. And it can't come down. Uh, it was, it's landmarked in New York State. So. That's the argument so far, that you can't take down a landmark thing. I think that could change sometime. Um, and uh, the, what the museum has decided to do is uh, explain, not delete. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's, that's a good approach. Maybe it isn't the right approach for everything, but I think it's an interesting way to think about solving this problem. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Very interesting. Thank you. So if those of you who have questions can uh, queue up behind the microphone. Sir? Hi. Um, why did Woodrow Wilson run for president in 1912? What was the motivation? And then also, um, I know after um, his presidency, you, you said it was a downward trajectory after the 18 election. And then in 1920, the Republicans romped to victory with Harding and Coolidge. Uh, what did he think about like, the entire party just collapsing in his wake after he left office? It's a great question. Yeah, that, that is a great question. When he ran in 1912, um, he was chosen by the Democrats because he was a, a fresh face. He didn't have any baggage. He'd only been in politics for two years. So, um, and he was a good, solid economic progressive. You know, we know now that he wasn't progressive on, on race. He wasn't progressive on women's issues either. He didn't support a constitutional amendment for suffrage till 1918, and he did it then because he knew it was going to happen and he wanted to be on the right side of history. Um, so he ran uh, because he was asked to run, and um, he, he, it's a four-way race in 1912. He's running against Taft, the incumbent. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt charges in at, for a third term, creates a new party, and then Eugene Debs ran um, also. So Wilson got 42% of the vote, and that was enough to um, get him elected. 
Um, and his, uh, it, after the election of 1918, when the Democratic Party collapsed, he, I'm interested in your question because he mostly didn't, uh, he wasn't so focused on that. He was f focused more on uh, like how idiotic the Republicans were, how they refused to face the realities of um, the world that had been changed by World War I. So he didn't really blame himself for that. And after he left the White House, the only regret he ever expressed about the fight, his failed fight for the Treaty of Versailles and the League of Nations was that his timing was wrong. He said, I think I was ahead of the American people on this one. So, and there he is, he's a very sick man. You know, he's had this stroke, he's still paralyzed, but he's imagining both in 1920 and then in 1922 that he's going to run for president again. Uh, you know, he's clearly not thinking straight, but one of the last things, the two, one of the two last, two of the last things that he wrote were uh, a sketch for, of his platform for 1924. I mean, this is a man who is really, really ill. And um, a draft of his uh, acceptance speech after he got the Democratic nomination in 1924. Um, he died early in 1924. He died in February 3rd, 1924. So it's, um, people ask me how I f feel about Woodrow Wilson as a person, uh, you know, what it was like to write about him, because he's not a cozy guy, you know. He wouldn't, like, ask him out for a beer. Um, and I, I feel like he was a really good man who wanted to do the right thing, but he just didn't acquire all the skills that a politician needs at the level of the presidency to do better than he did. But I still admire his economic achievements, and I still admire his ambition for the world to figure out a way uh, for, for global cooperation. Yes, another Sir, question? The, we'll go on this side. Oh, yep. OK. Uh, yes, uh, thank you for the presentation. I came in here by chance, and it's more serendipity now. So oh, I it's your lucky that. day, isn't it? Yes, yeah. it is. Hi. Uh, <laughs> So how did, how, how did Wilson square his moralism with the uh, behavior of the Allies? Uh, so thinking about something like the Belfort Declaration or the Sykes-Picot Agreement or other uh, colonialist activities that yes. came out yeah. of uh, the Paris uh, negotiations. Yes, that's, um, that's an excellent question. Um, he, his, his big, he thought, that his big achievement in that regard was they, um, in you know, the former colonies of the other side, the Germans, and uh, were taken away from them. And rather than um, just declare these things, um, rather than divide them up among the other victors, um, he convinced the Allies at the peace conference that they should be mandates of these powers. And the powers, you know, like France had some, well, it doesn't, I don't want to get in the weeds, but um, he saw that as an improvement on imperialism. And it was kind of, in a way, the beginning of the end of um, colonialism. So that was his contribution. And he didn't like these things uh, at all. But um, the, one, of his, one of the problems at the peace conference is the, um, principal powers that were negotiating this, the Germans were not invited to the peace conference. And they had decided among themselves, the victors, that they had to, when they wrote an article into the treaty, it would be after all of them agreed on it. They had to have unanimity, because they thought if they didn't, that would be open to challenge by the defeated powers. So Wilson often argued very intelligently and very forcefully for his point of view, but if the vote in the end is three to one, and you have this unanimity thing, he has to go along with the other side. So he did win some concessions, but not, not enough. So that's, I think, a possibly good way to look at Wilson and the colonialism after World War I. Yeah. Gentleman yes. Gentleman over here. So you mentioned how critical the election in November 1918 was. I'm just curious about what was Wilson up to, what his priorities were in the month, six weeks, for that October 1918 when he was trying to win that election and negotiate an armistice and think about the future all at once. Yes. Um, 
in, he, he was certainly more occupied with thoughts of peace than anything else. And he made a fatal blunder uh, in the weeks leading up to the election. He uh, sent an appeal to the country saying he needed them to vote Democratic because he was going to go to the peace conference and he had to have the solid backing of the American people. And the Republicans were insulted, and I think justifiably so, because the Republicans, when it came to uh, votes on uh, lending money to the Allies before we were in the war, and then going, you know, building up the Army and Navy in case we had to be in the war, and war spending itself, the Republicans were there as a solid block behind Wilson. And it was people from the middle of the country, not all of them, or, um, Southerners who didn't, you know, they just thought, we don't have any business going beyond the, the United States. So I actually, in my book, use the word dumbest to describe this move of his. And a couple editors asked me, do you really, you know, that's not your usual tone with things. Do you, do, do you really want to use that word? Um, and I, I thought about it hard and long, and I decided I did. I mean, it was really dumb. Um, <laughs> so, um, uh, he, he was, he just, and his wife begged him not to send this out. I think Colonel House begged him, too, not to send it out, but, but he did, and the, the rest was very sad. Yeah. Yes? Uh, well, I plan to be here because um, teaching the Middle East, uh, talking about Woodrow Wilson was very important. So to follow up on my colleague's question, <laughs> um, the King Crane Commission, would you like to comment on that, that he sent to the Middle East to ask, uh, this was 1919, um, was that kind of part of, again, this moralist, um, principled man who wanted to ask the people who lived in that part of the world what they wanted? You know, he was so busy at the Paris Peace Conference and he took along this group of people called The Inquiry. Have you read about them and their work? Um, there's a very good book by a man named Lawrence Gelfand that details what they're doing. There's a lot of smart people who were expert in different parts of the world, cartographers, geographers, economists, and so on. Um, and uh, the answer to your question is, is probably in there, but he took their advice on a lot of things. So if this idea had come to him, he would have said, well, what do the men at the inquiry think about this and would have followed their advice. So it's something that really didn't get on my radar very much. I'm sorry, I can't be more help. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Ma'am. Yes. Thank you. I was wondering who were his mentors as maybe starting college in that area? Who did he look up to? And then it's maybe a different question, but what, who did he listen to? That's what I'm wow. Uh, yes, uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, his mentors, um, the, the statesmen who inspired him were uh, the great orators. So, you know, Lincoln, um, Calhoun, um, Webster in, in the United States, and then in England it was um, uh, Sir William Gladstone and a guy named Cobb. And they were all people who were really great speakers who managed to, pers you know, managed to sway Parliament to do something or other. So those were his, his models. And then as, uh, the question of who he listened to, um, he got more and more isolated as he was president. He was a better listener early on. Uh, his Treasury Secretary, William Gibbs McAdoo, um, became his son-in-law. And um, Wilson did, because he's in the family, you know, uh, so he, he would listen to McAdoo, but he really didn't like it very much. And um, he listened to Colonel House up till 1918, and that's mainly it, yes. Thank you. Well, well thank you very much, much Patricia. This has thank been fascinating. Thank you, John. Thank you very much. Thanks for great interview. Thank, thank you.